Hello, and welcome to our Friday webinar. We are back with Pamela Clark. Welcome, Pamela. Hello. Well, it's so been a nice while, but so again. excited to have you back with us. <laughs> Let's see. And then, um, and we're doing, we're doing a, a I think this is going to be a very, very uh, popular and important topic. We're going to do um, your series on translating parrot behavior misconceptions. So do I have a problem parrot? This is, uh, I, I can't wait to to see what questions we get about, we, we get here today. Um, so yeah, this is gonna be like a, like we were just saying a minute ago before I started, a, a Q and A. So um, we expect to have, if we have a lot of questions, we're also doing a part, this is part one of, of a part two series. So if we don't get to your question today, uh, we might be saving it for the next um, follow-up webinar on the topic, right? Um, and with that, I just wanna remind everybody to please use the Q and A button instead of the chat button so that we can, Get to the questions easier and uh yeah and i one of my favorite things now um pamela it just is is seeing where everyone's logging in from so um it's on the chat feature i guess here where everyone's coming from it's so it's i like to see our, our um you know our reach here so it's, it's kind of fun so to speak so yeah um all right i so i'm sure we have a bit of territory to cover because this is behavior this is like this is a, a very um popular topic. So if you, uh, again, just to use the Q and A button, please, and not the chat feature. And, um, yeah. So any, any kind of, uh, opening statement that you, any opening words you have for us about parent, parent behavior in general, or anything like that? Sure. I can make an opening statement. <laughs> Cause um, it's such a huge, important topic. Trying it's to understand a very that. huge, important topic. And I would just start out by saying that in my experience, behavior problems develop because of two parallel things that are happening. The first is that people just don't know how to take care of their birds. So there might be inappropriate diet provisions or social interactions. Uh, maybe the environment just doesn't fit the bird. And then also a lack of guidance. That would be the second thing that occurs at the same time. I don't think that we're used to living with an animal that requires constant guidance. Um, you know, mostly people don't train their cats. They do train their dogs. But if my recent visit to the vet clinic is any um, example, they don't train their dogs well. They just train their dogs enough to get by. And so with parrots, they do need, you know, they match us in intellect and they have, I believe, a social and emotional intelligence that is greater than ours. So given that, how could you not have problems? And these days, more and more folks are keeping flighted birds, which is wonderful. Um, I want to see more and more and more of that. But then it becomes even more important to keep birds in the right way, because a lot of the uh, clients that come to me these days, they're dealing with things like flighted attacks and, um, you know, aggression on the wing, as it were. Yeah. And anything people make the, um, they're new to birds, they they try to relate to how they relate to dogs as pets or cats as pets and think that the behaviors and the way that you would address them is similar. Is that kind of a I think that we do borrow a lot of things from the dog world. Um, <laughs> yes, I think that, that that certainly exists. You know, with dogs, we do a lot more punishing than we do with birds, of course. But um, for the most part, I think that people do treat their, their birds, um, you know, they're looking for some kind of guidance. Let's put it that way. And so they will borrow from any place they've got previous knowledge from the dog training world, as well as from social media today. And the problem is that 98% of the information on social media today is wrong. So um, folks have a very hard time. And that's why I'm happy to be here today. Okay, good point. Good point. Um, okay, I got the first question for you. Um, where this is about a seven-month-old male cockatiel who, in the last three weeks, has made it his mission to pull every hair on their body on the, on the uh, out by the roots, but actually, um, not just preening, but actually pulling their hair out. 
So the eyebrows, uh, mustache, arms, head, everything is fair game to him and it hurts a lot. So is there anything they can do to break him of, of this habit of actually pulling their hair out, not just like preening it, you know, gently like birds do. Pulling the humans, correct? The humans hair, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Yes, there's a very easy solution for that. I know that it is common for everyone to keep their birds on their shoulders. We as people get a lot of emotional support from doing that. But the reality is uh, we shouldn't be allowing our birds on our bodies. And so in a case like this, you just set up a perch right next to you and teach the bird to stay there through stationing practice. And then it's win-win. The bird gets to be right next to you on a perch. You'll make sure that you have something for him to do right there. He'll be happy there and you can be happy and won't get your hair pulled anymore. But that's about the only way to stop that problem. There isn't any way, um, you know, if you just push the bird away in the, in the, you know, as he's trying to perform those behaviors, you're just going to create a lot of frustration in him. And if you pick him up and put him on another perch, he's just going to come back most likely. And often the things that we try and do to stop behaviors wind up reinforcing them instead. So this is one of those cases. The only solution is just get him off your body. Okay. Um... Great. And we have a question about sleep, um, sleep routines. Um, so when bedtime hits, is it, do you recommend, is it required to cover or keep the bird covered in a uh, cage covered or uncovered? And, um, and then, uh, is it, is it necessarily not to be in the room completely while they're asleep? So do you need to like give your bird like complete space when it's, when, when they're going to bed or, and, and are your thoughts on covering the cage versus keeping the cage okay. uncovered? Well, when it comes to covering the cage, I recommend that you keep doing whatever you have been doing. Because if you haven't been covering the cage and you try and start doing that, you're going to scare the bird badly. Birds do not like things coming over their heads. So if you haven't been covering, then you shouldn't start. If you have been covering the cage, then you should continue to do so because by now your bird has become habituated to that experience. And if you stop covering it, he may not uh, sleep very well. Now, the standard dogma I know is that parents need 12 hours of uninterrupted sleep every night, hopefully in the pitch black. This is not true, and it's never been true. Uh, people think it's true just because so many people repeat that information, but it's not true. There uh, is a moon in the wild most nights. It's not quiet in the wild. There are nocturnal animals moving around. Nocturnal uh, raptors, predators exist. Moreover, many birds display what we call hemispheric sleep meaning that they only sleep with one hemisphere of the brain at a time. So parrots don't actually need any particular circumstances to sleep well. Um, I don't recommend sleep cages in most cases, simply because parrots can begin to interact with them as if they're nest cavities. Um, you know, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Did that answer it? Yeah. And, and your thoughts on, um, I guess someone, if you're in the room with your bird when it's sleeping, like, let's say you have just another scenario. Like, what if you have a one bedroom apartment and you have a bird that obviously needs to sleep? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. You know, um, birds don't have to have any special area to sleep. So it doesn't matter if you're in the room when they're sleeping or not. They don't need quiet. And they don't need any special circumstances to sleep well. Okay. I guess they adjust to like, we, we kind of adjust to well, people in our place in our houses too. Like, you know, your roommates are your significant others, right? You all get different sleep schedules too. So you kind of adjust maybe a little bit too. It really doesn't matter. Honestly, it doesn't matter. You can just have your bird sleep in the cage and it doesn't matter what's going on around them. You know, maybe if you're staying up until two o'clock in the morning playing loud movies, that might be difficult for the bird, but in most cases, people wind down along about nine o'clock at night, and so do parents. So I don't, it's never sure. been an issue. 
All right. And um, question about a parallet. Um, so a parallet stop, their, their parallet stopped stepping up um, without biting about six months ago. So this parallet, she used to be very socialized. You know, they used to be able to go under her, her large flight cage and have her step up and come out. And then one, once out, she flies anywhere else. Um, she will step up without biting. But even interacting on a table or one of her play centers, she wants to bite. Um, and when they travel, she's in a small travel carrier. And in that situation, she's like their best buddy when they're traveling in a small travel carrier. Um, so she never bites when we travel. And even when we put her in a smaller travel cage, not sure when this started, um, what started the biting issue. So, yeah. okay. So stepping up is a behavior that is often punished because we may step the bird up and take them somewhere they didn't want to go. Sometimes we step them up and put them back in the cage again. And so, any behavior that does not get reinforced is going to stop offering. So if we step the bird up half the time and something good happens, and then we step, step it up half the time and something the bird didn't want happens, then we have a bird who's not going to step up very well. And the biting has the function of just avoiding the stepping up. That's all. So with aggression and stepping up, the way that you deal with it kind of depends upon how serious the problem is. But since she does step up when she's out of the cage, this is what I would recommend. First of all, you need some kind of reinforcer, some kind of food that she wants. If she likes millet spray, you can use that, but you're going to have to figure out something, even if it's just an apple slice, anything that this bird wants. And then you will go over, and I want you to do this as a one-off uh, type of intervention. So you're not going to repeat it over and over. You're going to go over to her, show her that you have the reinforcer, and bring your hand up in whatever configuration you usually use. And then, and I don't want your hand close enough that she can bite you or actually step up onto it. So the first part is just communication. Look what I've got. You can have it if you'd like to step up. And then what you do is you wait for her little foot to come up. That is a sign that she wants to. She's saying yes. Then you let her get on your finger, give her a bite of the reinforcer, and then put her right back down again. That way she learns that if she steps up, you're not necessarily going to ask anything more of her. And um, she got the reinforcer. So she will start to step up more and more and more. Now, I would recommend practicing this outside the cage first and then start uh, practicing it inside. If, if you do it outside, you'll develop a history of reinforcement and then she will be much more likely to step up uh, inside the cage once you get to working in there on it. But I, I do this constantly with my own birds. You know, none of them refuse to step up. Why is that? Because I do this every day, once, twice, or three times a day. Often it's when I'm eating because I generally eat a pretty healthy diet. So I can tell if one of my birds wants a bite of whatever it is I'm eating, I'll go over, step them up give them a bite and put them right back down again. So you can do that as a one-off up to three times a day. That usually solves the problem unless you've really got a land shark or unless the human is very, very fearful. And then we would use more of a system where you would make your hand an extension of the perch and then reinforce the bird for coming closer to it. Okay. Okay. Um, and then we have a question about a, a 30 year old male umbrella cockatoo that they've had for a few years from a rescue. So he, um, he barber, he, he barbers his flight feathers, which keep growing in nicely, but he twists them in the middle and bites them in half. Um, any way to, to deter this, to deter it, to curb it, to play with the, the feathers? Yes. I'm sure there's a way to help the situation. Uh, I'd like to know whether he also destroys his feathers anywhere else on his body, or if it's only the flight feathers. Typically, if birds focus just on their flight feathers or their tail, 
Stress is a big part of the cause. So I would look at whether this bird is getting his needs met or not. To back up just a little bit, I would say that two years kind of seems to be the cutoff. If a bird has been feather damaging for two years or more, we may not be able to resolve the problem. The same thing goes for self-mutilation. Uh, both of those, if they've been going on for less than two years, I can usually resolve them. Unless, of course, there's a, a physical problem. So this, I don't know, it sounds to me a little bit like a stereotypy. I'd love to be able to consult about this bird uh, to see what exactly is going on. Um, but first of all, I would reduce every single trigger for hormone production. It's very hard to keep a male cockatoo in the house. So if he's getting to sit on anybody's shoulder or lap, no, that needs to end. You can end it gradually by teaching him to station on a perch. But if he's getting a high calorie diet or he gets to go cavity seeking or gets to sit on anybody else's lap, then ending those practices would go a long way towards ending this particular behavior. But you also might have to really step in with keeping him thinking throughout the day, you know, foraging trays and hands-on training. Um, it would be great to see if you could teach him to fly a little bit at the point where they do become grown in. I don't know, it sounds like a very complex case. I'm not sure that I can say anything more about it than that. Okay, okay. Uh, that was, I mean, you got some some starter information for them to to, to work with, so that was good. Um, there, the, the, Amazon, there, the next question is um, the Amazon that likes to scream, usually when he wants attention. So should they cover him or any other alternatives? How do you, how do you address a parrot that's screaming and they don't want to reinforce that? Okay. I love this question because it's a, it's it's a so very, funny. it's a very common question. And I totally, I mean, what's your best advice on that? Cause. Well, the know. answer is so easy. So here is the foremost rule that governs behavior. Any behavior that gets a reward is going to occur more often in the future. And parrots love predictability. Uh, they can be reinforced by things other than food. So if a bird screams and you get up and give it attention, even to cover it, even screaming at the bird can reinforce that behavior. So no, covering is not any sort of effective solution for screaming. The first thing that you have to do is absolutely ignore the screaming. But even that concept has become confused in recent years because many people now think that if you're ignoring the screaming, that means you're leaving the room. No, ignoring means you don't take an action. You don't do anything. And so if that bird, while they're screaming, you're going to act like that bird um, doesn't even exist in the house. You're going to walk right past him, and you should not even talk about him. Many older parrots, especially umbrellas, those that are really smart, they understand English. So even talking to each other about the bird's noise has the capability of reinforcing their behavior on some level. And But now let me state loud and clear, ignoring the screaming will never get rid of it. All it does is it removes the reward for the screaming. In a case like this, what we have to do is to give the bird another way to get your attention. And that can be any sound that he makes. If he has even just one word that he says. Um, many times, larger cockatoos, when they want something you have, they'll make a sound kind of like, mm hmm So even a little sound like that can be reinforced. And it has to happen exactly like this. You're going to have to use a verbal bridge. Reinforcers or rewards have to be delivered immediately after a behavior is offered. And you may well be across the room from your bird when he makes that pleasant sound. So when you hear him make a pleasant noise, you're going to immediately call out, yes, 
and then walk over and give him a favorite food treat. The more you do that, the more you will hear. Remember, any behavior that gets a reward will occur more often in the future. If you reward screaming, you get screaming. If you reward talking or coos or whistles, you'll get talking coos and whistles. Now, in the meantime, the noise might be difficult to live with. I recommend this little product. It's called The Loop. It is available on Amazon for $24.95. It's just a little gold ring that fits in your ear. It's very comfortable. So it just mm -hmm. looks like that. Okay. And they are engineered to reduce the noise by 20 decibels. So you can still hear each other speak. You can have conversations. You can listen to television. But you'll be able to ignore the noise without having to leave the house. Oh, wow. So, that, that's an amazing product. I, I don't, I've yeah. never heard of that before. That's a, yeah, they work very, very well. And then, of course, you're also going to see if there are any triggers for increased hormone production going on because increased hormone production puts any parrot into a state of heightened arousal. Any parrot in a state of heightened arousal is gonna be more likely to scream or bite or feather damage. So you also may have to look at diet, the way you interact with the parrot, whether he's getting out of his cage enough, things like that. But in terms of the behavior intervention that will work, that is it. So can I, I have a question about, about um, competing on the phone with the parrot? Because you always, you know, hear stories like, so like your phone rings and you know how parrots, when you're on the phone answering a call, some of them come yeah. alive and they just want to like out, so they want to talk with you. So do you, do you, um, how do you address that in your like when your phone rings and you have to answer it? Do you do you answer it like go out of the room with it? I'm assuming most people don't have landlines anymore. Before you'd kind of be forced to answer it in the room that your parrot might be in. Yeah. But what what do you, what's your my birds don't scream when I answer the phone, but the answer to that is just leave the room and go talk on the phone or use a speakerphone or something. Uh, don't hold it up to your ear because there isn't any way to make the bird stop performing the behavior in the moment. So it's something that you've got to change. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Someone, ha uh, my two young, um, I'm sorry, my young two-year-old Linny bullies, and we're talking biting toes, tries to fight their older seven-year-old Linny. So we're talking about lineated parakeets. Um, they keep them in separate cages, but they're allowed to visit their respective cages. Um, why does, um, why does the, the the younger one continuously bully um, and attack um, her? I, I imagine one's male, one's female. Um, she tries to fight back, but she's not as strong. So you've got a bully. What do you do when you, you have a bully in the flock, so to speak? Mm -hmm. Is there a bully? Is there That's a, yeah, uh, that is a difficult problem to solve because the behavior of the bird who's getting bullied reinforces the behavior of the one who's doing the bullying. So you pretty much have to prevent it. What I would do is put these birds' cages much farther apart, at least five feet apart. So it takes them more effort to go fly over to each other's cages. And then I might uh, proceed to do some kind of counter conditioning exercise. I would teach both birds to target and then put them on training stands as far apart from each other uh, or far enough apart, apart that they don't distract each other and then do mutual targeting with them. You can do it with another person. So you are each targeting one of the birds, or if you're not fast enough to target both, you can target one, run over, give a reinforcer for stationing to the second one, and then come back and target the first. And then what you do is you gradually move those stands closer together. So it uh, creates a bit of a different relationship between the birds. The bully learns to mind his own business and just stay there targeting and not do the bullying. And the bully learns to be less of the one who has been bullied learns to be less afraid of the bully because something positive is happening 
in uh, proximity to the bully. So okay. th those would be the two main things. But yeah, whenever there's um, distress between two birds, put them farther apart. It helps a lot. Okay. And I mean, I guess is that, that that's a good, that people might not, would, would some of the behaviors be mistaken for like trying to play instead of being a, like they, they mentioned biting the toes. Like, is that like a telltale sign of like the birds bo bo um, bullying another one when they go after like the toe, like are they trying to scooch them off the perch or what would be some, some. You want to, I think to answer that question, you look at the behavior of the bird being bullied. Is he trying to get away? Uh -huh. If he's trying to get away, he's not playing. He's trying to get, trying to escape. Okay, I guess that's a good that's a good take. That, that's probably why you like having him in the same cage would be a, a terrible situation because they wouldn't be able to get away. <laughs> it's, it's... You should never have two birds in the same cage. Okay, there you go. Um, question about a pionis. Um, they've had a pionis since he hatched, and he's now nineteen years old. The cockatiel passed away last year at nineteen, almost. Um, let's see, our cocktail passed away last year at the age of 19, almost, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. At almost two years ago. Um, they had their own cage. They grew up together. They were able to go from one cage to the other. They constantly wonder if their bird feels lonely in, in terms of not having the other bird now to communicate with. Mm -hmm. They're in different cages, but they always had each other, you know, in the same yeah. room. Yeah. He probably does feel lonely. Certainly he remembers the cockatiel. I think he understands that the cockatiel died and isn't there any longer. It's a tough question because I never think it's a good idea to get a bird for an existing bird. So I, I can't in good conscience suggest that you get a co another cockatiel or even another parrot if you really don't want one. Instead, um, I'm sure if this happened two years ago, you probably have stepped in to provide some additional enrichment. I, what I would do is make sure that this bird gets to be a part of your flock. If he's the only bird, then make sure that you are allowing him to be in proximity to you whenever you're at home. So if you're in the kitchen, let him come in the kitchen. That will help to make up for the fact that he doesn't have another avian flock mate. If you do want to get another bird, then I say hallelujah. I think it's um, a great thing whenever there is not a single bird in the house. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. This is a lengthy one. So bear with me if I can read this correctly. Okay. So they have a Congo African gray. Um, they've been working with on her step ups and coming out of the cage. And she's most confident when her cage, um, she's most confident when in her cage at this time, but she does enjoy, she does enjoy coming out onto shelf perches that extend out of the cage where she gets head scratches and treats. So she has a history of fearful behaviors and they want to foster her um, her feeling safe while encouraging her to expand her world, to be confident outside the cage. So she calmly steps up for um, her husband uh, uh, from a perch inside the cage, which they have worked on together um, through positive reinforcement. So he has um, next used shaping to work on, they're, they're working on moving her very short distances toward the door of the cage once um, on his hand but she detects any movement while on the hand and she quickly steps back off onto her perch. So he, her husband is allowing her that choice. Um, they're wondering mm -hmm. if, um, if duration should be the next step instead of movement. Um, any other idea oh. kind of make this bird have positive feelings about going outside the cage on a hand. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, this has been an excellent question. Going through that doorway does seem to freak them out when they're on your hand. The first thing I'd recommend is that you deliver reinforcers in a shot glass that because you're gonna to have to be reinforcing her the entire time that she's standing on your hand. And that can be very hard if you're having to move reinforcers up from your palm. So I would say whatever reinforcer you're using, cut it into very small pieces and put it in a shot glass. You can just offer the shot glass and basically feed her the entire time. 
Um, I can't tell. I could if I were there, but I can't tell whether you should work for duration or try and get her out of the cage. But I think also you should be teaching her to target. If you're not doing that yet, I would certainly start that because you could also try targeting her out of the cage. And that might be a little easier for her than coming out on your hand. Um, my hunch is it would be better to get her out of the cage and then work on duration because what she wants is to stay in the cage. I'm just thinking this through as I'm talking. And so if you work on duration while she's in the cage, you're just reinforcing her for wanting to stay in the cage. So I think what you're going to have to do is step her up and just use you know, micro approximations in terms of getting her out. So letting her just continuously eat and just, you know, in very, very small distances, get her out of the cage and then work on duration. But if you're having trouble with that, start the targeting. That will build her confidence, target her out of the cage, and then see if you can step her up out of the cage. Okay. Um... All right, going through great a number of questions. This is you, this is amazing. Um, okay, so um, okay, so someone said uh, the, the, since you said never to keep birds in the same cage, what about parakeets? Like three parakeets in a large cage, would that be okay? I mean, like budgies, like three budgies in a cage. Oh gosh, it depends on in a big how cage, large, like flight or. Well, I have <laughs> my I have a budgie in a flight cage, and it's only like. 30 inches wide, you know, um, it did, the dimensions matter because people tell me all the time that their bird has a huge cage. Their idea of huge is quite different from my idea of huge. So I would not keep three budgies in a cage that was any less wide than 36 inches by probably 24 and here's why. It's because birds are never at the same level of forwardness. You're always going to have one bird who is more stronger, faster, um, more forward. And so what happens then is you develop some competition. And before you know it, there may be one bird who's not getting enough to eat. And you would never know it because if you have three birds of the same species in a cage, the droppings all look the same. So it's not uncommon for situations like that, this to exist. And then people say, oh, one of them just died and I don't know why. Well, you might have known why if you didn't have them all in the same cage. Uh, so yeah, it can work with budgies, but you've got to be very careful. And I would certainly have one more food dish than you have birds. So if you've got three budgies, put four food dishes in there and at least two water dishes. That way, if one budgie knocks another budgie away from the food dish, there's another one to go to. There's always one free. So that helps to ameliorate the fact that there's going to be some competition. Okay. All right. Um... Um, okay, so we have a question about it. Uh, Indian ringneck, I'm sorry, uh, IRN. So Indian ringneck um, stops stepping up and refuses to go back in his cage to the point where he will stay out of the cage until morning, um, perching and sleeping on the cabinet. So they've tried so many ways to get him back in because they think it's wrong for him to be out of his cage during the night. If, if that, I'm sure they want to know if that's what your thoughts would be as well. Um, they're out their wits in to know how to get him back in the cage at nighttime. Um, so what's your best advice for that kind of a scenario? Okay. So I would tackle this problem in two steps. Step one would be find something this bird wants and then work it so you can reliably lure him into the cage when you need him to go back in. So if you give him food at the end of the day, um, somewhere, you might make sure you put it in the cage so that he will reliably go in and you can close the door. If you don't generally give him an evening meal of some sort to forage through, then what you can do is just identify something that he really, really likes. 
hopefully he's not eating a diet that is a seed mix because it's hard to motivate a bird who eats a seed mix, but you could, you could even try fruit. So here's a typical thing that I recommend. If the bird likes nutriberries or if they like grapes, scrambled eggs, millet, just find something that the bird really, really, really wants and then make it scarce. So the only time he gets it is when he goes into his cage. And then predictability will help quite a bit also. So if you're going to put him to bed, then put him to bed. And I'm sorry, if you're going to put him in his cage every evening, try and make it at about the same time because then he'll start to anticipate that. Anticipation is a very pleasurable experience for animals, including birds. So he will then just get it in his head. Oh, at 5 p.m. I get to go in and get my break, my grape every mm -hmm. single night. But I think that you probably don't want to rely on something like that. It's a lot better if you can step your bird up and put them into the cage. So if the bird will step up at all, any time, then I would suggest you do, as I prescribed for the other listener earlier, you figure out what kind of treat you're going to use for the step up. You bring your hand up, but not close enough that the bird can actually get on it. And you wait for their foot to come up. This is very important. It's called the start button. Parrots should have a choice about whether they step up or not. And this is a way to give them a choice. And then once he brings his foot up, you can bring your hand in, let him get on it, give him a reinforcer, and then let him get right back off again. Now, if he doesn't bring his foot up, you can, so don't stay there and ask a second time. Instead, immediately walk away. But only for less than a minute and then come back and perform the same sequence of movements again. Many times birds will rethink their answer. They'll realize that they lost the opportunity for a reinforcer and they will do it the second time. Um, and so you would just do that to once again, develop a history of reinforcement, just so you could get the bird on your hand. Now you can't start stepping him up and putting him back in his cage right away, because then you will be punishing the stepping up. So what you do in that case then is something very similar. You step the bird up and let him eat from your shot glass all the way over to the cage. And then you put him in the cage and then just let him come right back out again. That usually solves that problem. But if you can lure him in in the short run, then you'll have time to do that training. Okay. Um... Another kind of a similar question. Um, this one with three cockatiels that have jealousy issues. Um, so when they pay attention to one, the other one will come over and interfere. So it's been a problem with training and, and things like that. Um, they want to know, how do you deal with one? How do you deal with jealous rivalry? And then also now one won't step up and they have a terrible time getting him to go in his cage at bedtime. So so you got you got a different scenarios well, going on. My answer to the last can just stand for this one. It's a very common problem. And here's the reality. These birds require constant guidance. So you should always be rewarding anything that you ask the bird to do, any cued behavior. So for all of you, for God's sake, anytime you step the bird up, give him a little something to reward him for that behavior. Anytime he goes into his cage, give him a little something. Um, whatever you're asking him to do, if you reward it, you'll never have problems like this. Now, birds are very competitive, of course. It's part of their nature. I know that we like to think of them as these mush muffins that just want to cuddle all day long, but not really. Uh, they're pretty savage and pretty competitive. So about the only thing that you can do in a case such as you described is if you want to train one bird, put the other two away. Then you have that bird's undivided attention. Or you can try and train two or even three birds at once. You can say, give a cue to this bird that you want to train and then have the other two nearby and you just so train this one, reinforce, 
reinforce, reinforce. Cue this one, reinforce, reinforce, reinforce. If you're fast enough, you can do it that way. Otherwise, just put the other two in their cages and train one at a time. That's the only solution. Oh, do you think in these kind of situations, um, when you have multiple birds, um, that other ones will catch on because one does, and then it kind of like a ripple effect, like um, maybe even trying like a new food or doing like a like a new behavior. They learn well, from it. Like no, they learn there's from no doubt that birds engage in imitative learning. So yes, it's totally possible that if one bird is being trained, the two others, even if they're in their cages, they'll be watching and learning. Is that what you meant? Yeah, just kind of like piggybacking off of like the when you have more than one bird, you know, like the training, for, uh, training, for example. Yeah, like for um, even if uh, do you find like if you had, let's say you had three birds and none of them uh, the, stepped up right away and then one started stepping up. Do you think that the others like viewed that as a positive thing to do and like, hey, maybe I should step up onto that hand and <laughs> things like that? No, I don't think so. No, I think no. that imitative learning takes place best when it's something that doesn't cost the bird anything, like eating chop or, you know, interacting with a new form of enrichment, something like that. Imitative learning will kick in in those situations. But if you think about it, asking a bird to step onto your hand is a big ask, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, usually things don't move in the wild, at least when birds step on them, the branch does not fall out from underneath them. And so I think it costs the bird quite a bit in terms of trust when they get on your hand. Okay. Yeah, so I, I don't think that's something that they'll see that they're probably next in line, but you yeah, will be like, it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Um, question about a yellow naped Amazon that, uh, they took in a year and a half ago, um, and they say she's fat. Uh, for thirty five for thirty five years, she was on a uh, seed only diet and and food, and now she's on pellets and vegetables. So they're working on the weight um, by more of movement, and they wanted to give rewards for things when she needs. Um, oh, what they do give uh, rewards for things when she needs to lose weight. Like, what what do you suggest that like as a reward? They're trying to have the, the it's an Amazon, yeah. right? So Amazons are foodies most like a lot of times. So well, <laughs> so if you really have her on a low calorie diet, you should be able to use some reinforcers that have fat and, or carbohydrates in them. Uh, you can't train a bird if you don't have something that they want to work for. Um, certainly you might be able to use secondary reinforcers like head scratches if she likes those or, you know, some kind of item. Sometimes birds like bottle caps or emery boards, you know, you, you might be able to get a little training done that way. I'm curious as to what pellet she's on because pellets all differ in terms of their metabolizable energy. She should be on either Rowdy Bush, Lefebvre, or Harrison's Adult Lifetime. If she's on any pellet other than that, then she ought to get transitioned because those are the highest quality pellets with the lowest metabolizable energy. Okay. Uh, she certainly shouldn't be on any pellet that has sugar within the first five ingredients or any pellet um, that does not have added vitamins and minerals. So, um, What can we use to reinforce an Amazon who's fat? I might try a millet spray. If she will eat millet, you might have to introduce it to her if she hasn't seen it before, but lots of large birds like millet spray. And you can cut off a two or three inch piece from the end that doesn't wobble so much and then just hold it bring it up to her and let her just get one or two seeds off of it and then pull it back. If you're careful about your distance and you don't bring it up too close, she won't be able to get too much of it. You could also try uh, vanilla yogurt on a spoon, applesauce on a spoon, 
Uh, you can go outside and break a twig off of a, a tree or a branch and then dip the tip in peanut butter and in crushed nuts because a lot of birds like to just take a little bit with the tip of their beak and then taste it with their tongue. It's more of a large macaw thing, but it's something she might like. That's just another way of using a high fat reinforcer. Oh, here's something. Oh, this is a great idea. Get peanut butter powder rather than peanut butter because it's like 80% lower fat. They even have it at Walmart. So go get peanut butter powder, mix it with water and use that as your reinforcer. Oh yeah, and that stuff's good for smoothies too, the peanut peanut butter powder. I Oh, I never even thought about that. Oh my yeah, god, super good. <laughs> it's like, yeah. It, it, yeah, yes. it's one of my favorites. Yeah, but you know, it's going to have to be something that has some carbs or some fats in it, or she's just not going to work for it. All right. Um, okay, we have a, an African Congo African gray question. So he, so the back the backstory is the Congo African gray recently uh, broke his beak, and so after surgery, he is now with an acrylic beak. Um, he's very smart and spoiled, and using the situation to boss them around. He's you know he's came out with a he's got an acrylic beak now. So um, they don't mind spoiling him because they feel sorry for him, but he's not eating his pellets. And also they say that um, outside, he is, all, he is outside all the time because um, they didn't safeguard his cage yet, but um, they can see already that they will have problems getting him in the cage. Any suggestions on what to do with the current situation? So you've got an African gray who just kind of went through, it sounds like a trauma. He's got like an acrylic beak now. They feel sorry for him. Um, and so they kind of inclined to spoil him a little bit. Hey, I have one question. When they say he's outside all the time, is that outside of the cage or outside of the house? That's a good question. It says, uh, he is at, he is outside all the time. Um, maybe they can clarify that for us. Well, um, in the outside board. the cage, it says in the chat. Okay. Um, very good. So it's of concern that he's not eating his pellets. So I would ask your veterinarian who just did the surgery if pain might be uh, causing him not to eat those. If that's the case, then your vet can prescribe an anti-inflammatory medication called Medicam or Meloxicam that might, because I don't know how far he is after surgery at this point. Um, not pain. Okay. Well, there's got to be some reason why he's not eating them. So if you're giving him a lot of goodies, then you need to back off on the goodies because parents will always eat what has, he just wants to eat his favorite foods. Okay. Um, we can't turn this into a consultation <laughs> on, you know, during this, but you have to stop giving him his favorite foods. If you're feeding him high calorie foods, then of course he's not gonna eat his pellets. So if that's the reason why he's not eating them, then stop that, cut all that crap out and go back to feeding him a good diet again. Uh, the second thing is if he won't go inside of his cage, then I, I believe I've already given you the exercise that will help that you get him on your hand put him down inside the cage, give him a high value reinforcer, and then just let him come right back out again. If you do that, say once or twice or three times a day, you will see him start to go in there. Further, you can lure him in, as I've already described, by putting something that he really loves and that is also scarce. In other words, don't let him have it at any time other than when he goes in his cage. So how about this? Take away all his favorite foods, give him his pellets and vegetables and Lefebvre Nutriberries and Ava Cakes. Those are high on my list of foods that should be fed as an evening foraging meal. And then you take one of those favorite foods and you put it in his cage and I bet he might go in. Nice, yeah. And you keep a, um, maybe like a, you know, like people have their, like a cookie jar, maybe just the, the go to bed or go back in your cage jar of, of treats and foods, like the favorite things. So. Kind of remind you to only save those for, for 
for those moments, right? Like to parcel them out of the diet until you need them. Right? Like, um, we have a lot of out. Like I, I'm, I'm, I kind of see a trend of we have a lot of questions about um, getting birds back in the cage, which is yes, so far, it's right? always a, a common side problem. Whenever I have a consultation, usually what drives people to me is some kind of behavior problem. But then I hear, and oh by the way, he doesn't step up very well, or he doesn't go back into his cage. Again, these are behaviors we often punish. If you want your bird to do them, then you have to reward them for doing it. It's like a paycheck. The, all of the information that I have given today comes from the science of applied behavior analysis. So this is scientific information. This, this works. So <laughs> if you reward a bird for doing certain behaviors, then they will do them. Conversely, any behavior that is not reinforced will stop being offered. So that explains what happens. Initially, these birds do step up. They do go back into the cage, but along the way, they get punished for doing so. They didn't want to perform that behavior, but they did it anyway. And so um, then they, they just stop doing it along the way, but it's easy to turn back around again. Okay, we have a question. Um, what behaviors would you make, um, would make you think your bird, think you are another bird, sorry. So they have a small conure and they wanna know what behaviors would would make your bird think you're another bird? Is there, I mean. I parrots are really, here's the thing. Parrots are really smart. You can't make your bird think you're another bird because you're not, you're a human and the bird is a sun conure, and the bird is smart enough to know that. That's true, yeah, I guess. Would that, how does that um, play in with, I was I was curious on um, mirrors. So when, when like a bird sees its reflection, like I'm, I'm, I always think mirrors in like male cockatiels for some reason, because that's how mine was. When they see, you know, they, they interact with the mirror so much, do you think they're viewing that as another bird or as, themselves that they're kind of looking at in the mirror well What's it's your... impossible to tell wouldn't it yeah be? i mean no it's, it's a, yeah you're right you're right. What, what is it? another bird or whether it is yeah yeah um themselves it's a big conversation actually but um it doesn't matter obviously <laughs> birds crave being around other birds they're flock animals and so that's why they love seeing their own image in a mirror. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. It's another bird. Uh, yeah. Or something to it, it, at least entertain them, you know, like, uh, yeah, no, I, I, it's, they see the movements it reflects. So I can imagine. Um, all right. We have a question about a kayak that started uh, rushing and frightening their 17 year old male son, Conyer. So they're housed separately and only out with diligent um, supervision. And they're both flighted. So how did they put the kayak in a timeout without solely in the place of the timeout? So without um, ruining, how do, you, well, how do you put them in timeout without making timeout a bad, uh, yeah. Well, you don't because timeouts don't work. Um, remember that I have said that a reinforcer has to be delivered immediately. Well, so does a punisher. And so if your kayak goes after the sun conure and you go over and step the kayak up and carry it over to the cage and put it in again, that is a massive reward. The kayak got your attention for his misbehavior. He may not care if he's going into the cage because he's riding a high that developed when he went after the sun conure. So no, what you have to do is teach the birds what you want them to do. Mm. And so this will seem to be review from earlier in this session. You're going to move the cages as far apart as you can get them. That solves or accomplishes a couple of things. Number one, it takes more effort for your kayak to fly over to the sun conure and vice versa, making it less likely that he might do so. And then moreover, the you know, parrots have 
big personalities. And if you let uh, a couple of birds who are not pair bonded out together, you'll see that they maintain quite a bit of distance between themselves. And so the closer that you have cages together, the more built up energy and angst you're gonna have. So you want the cages far enough apart that the birds can kind of relax and your son kind of can realize, oh, he's, he's not right on top of me anymore. And your kayak will relax and, and be like, well, oh, well, I'm, you know, I guess I'm just going to let him be because he's not in my face anymore. So that will help to help everybody simmer down and take the pressure off. And then you need to do some joint training where you have them both out together on two separate perches that are far enough apart that they can't, they, they don't distract each other. So in other words, they can both pay attention to the cues that you're giving them. Now, if the birds don't know how to target, you'll have to teach that first. But then you uh, simply target them where they are on their separate perches. And then as you see that you're able to do so, you gradually bring the perches closer and closer and closer together until the birds can sit right next to each other and target. And that should get rid of competition, but you're, you're always going to have to, um, to watch that, that particular relationship. Okay. Um, and someone asked, is it always necessary to give treats when a bird steps up or goes into the cage? Sometimes they just offer praise and like their cocktail complies by hurriedly uh, from the stick on into her cage, but they wonder if their hasty dash into the cages and um, is that shows something like a fearful compliance or uh... yeah, it, if they're dashing into the cage, that would indicate some some level of fear, I would think. Um, but that would need some unpacking to figure out what was going on. I'm sorry, what was the first part of that? So they want to know if, if you always need to give like a treat oh. to reward a bird for, for stepping up or going in the cage. Sometimes they don't, they just say like, verb, I think verbally or. Okay. Yeah. Every client who comes to me tells me that their bird loves praise, but from a scientific perspective, praise is not likely to be as valuable to your bird as a food reinforcer is. We differentiate between primary and secondary reinforcers. Primary reinforcers are something that the bird needs to live. That's why we train with food most often. A secondary reinforcer is an item or a behavior that has come to have value because it's been associated with a primary reinforcer. So for instance, head scratches can sometimes be a secondary reinforcer because they've been associated with you giving the bird food at some point in the past. Uh, so few birds are going to maintain a behavior just because you tell them what a good bird you are. And here's why. Scarcity lends value. If you never talked to your bird at all, and then you said, good job, whenever you stepped up, your praise might have a chance of having some value. But most of us talk to our birds all the time. Oh, you're such a good guy. Look at you. You're so handsome. If we're jabbering away all day long at our birds, then telling them that they've done a good job is not going to be particularly reinforcing, especially because that implies that parrots care what we think. And I don't think parrots care what we think. They don't care if we think they've done a good job. <laughs> so um, do you always have to give a food reinforcer? Well, humans will never always do anything, right? We are mostly very inconsistent, imperfect creatures. So you do your best. Keep some reinforcers in your pocket or in a training pouch. And in the beginning, if you have any compliance issues, you'll probably want to reward it a lot. 
uh, once you get the birds back to a place where they are 100% compliant, then you might only reward those behaviors once a day. But if you don't reward them effectively with something that the bird values, it doesn't matter if you value it or if you think the bird values it. It's got to be something the bird actually values if you want that behavior to continue. Okay. Um, how we you got, you got through a good amount of questions. Um, and then we're doing a part two of this. So um, I'm sure we'll, we'll, what questions we didn't get to today, we'll, we'll um, answer those in our next, next session, as well as probably new ones that pop up. Um, Pam, Pam, but this, these are great. I mean, it's, this is, uh, I think we could probably, <laughs> we keep doing multiple parts of this topic since it's like, a, you know, behavior is so important to your bird's health and well-being. Um, uh, let's see. So I, I was going to just announce that, um, I, this is a hard, uh, uh, recently we, um, the bird world, uh, actually the animal world, the world, uh, lost a, 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 a good soul, uh, Chris Davis, um, passed away, uh, recently. And, and she was, uh, if anyone's not familiar with her boy, uh, behaviorist, uh, she knew animals so well, she was just a kindred spirit with them. And, um, uh, just, yeah, she was a huge part of the Lefebvre family as well. So, um, yeah. Uh, but I, you know, yeah. I won't say we lost her because I, I swear Chris is in everything. Like she's just, you look at nature and you can sense Chris in that. So, um, yeah. Yeah, she she was a big part of the bird world and we'll all miss her. I knew her back 30 years ago. And um, so it is, it's a loss. Yeah, oh yeah, just a, a but yeah, uh, my God, yeah. Uh, but you know, um, it, it, we we learn a lot about, you know, just just uh, how to interact with the, you know, these little, these special, parts of our lives from, you know, like behaviorists like you and Chris and, and just, uh, it's just, you know, it's, um, it's great that people join us to, to get, they, they want to have the best relationship possible with their birds. And, and you guys, you know, it, it's, this is an important, um, topic that to learn so you can have the best relationship with your feathered friend. So Chris, yeah, helped definitely make that happen too. So, um, all right, I'm going to get emotional with this because, uh, um, but anyway, uh, so yeah, huge part of the Lefebvre family and, um, and just a, a big imprint on uh, the bird world. So I'm going to announce today's winner of our giveaway. Um, and that is going to go to Joan, um, uh, Gold, I'm, I'm going to say the name of Joan, uh, Golston. Um, thank you for joining us today. You're going to get some pumpkin spice nutri berries as well as another Lefebvre product of your bird's choosing. And I think I know Joan. Do you? Yeah. yeah. Hopefully that makes your weekend, your bird's weekend. You got to try the pumpkin spice nature berries. Um, they smell delicious. I, I might have to try one myself because they just smell really good. If you have a chance. Um, also next, next Friday, I was going to announce that we actually have a, a, a new, a new webinar, um, guest and it has it was new, new door webinars. That's going to be Dr. Natalie Antonoff. And she's going to cover, um, I always say this word wrong, arthrosclerosis and pet birds. Um, and it, it can be like a silent or hidden killer. So, um, you know, you tune in and find out how you can, you know, what it is and how it's diagnosed and any warning signs and how it can be treated. So next Friday, we'll be doing that. And um, yeah, so we have a new, 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 new person. And, and we're, I'm, I'm excited that we get to have you back for another session of this, Pamela. So thank I, you. I, this was a lot of fun for me. I could do this all day long. It's a lot of fun. I love it because I learn, I learn, I mean, I, I, these, I, my silly questions come to my mind as you're answering other questions. And I, 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 so I get this opportunity to ask someone who knows so much more about her behavior than I could ever imagine. I get a first hand. I mean, it's, I, it's, it's awesome. So thank you. And I look forward to our next session. So um, on that note, everybody, I just want to wish you a fabulous weekend. All this, all the best you and your flock. Everyone to stay safe until next time. Bye. Bye-bye now.